And you know, the thing with feminism, the way that feminism got very wrong-headed about birth. Uh, <clears throat> I can remember the young feminist that got so famous in North America. Her name is Sheila Miss Firestone. And she was maybe 23 years old when she wrote this book called The Dialectic of Sex. That sounds so intellectual, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It was a very unsexy book. <laughs> <laughs> but it, she basically said women will not be liberated until we take all of the birth, birth technology that men invent. And, and she said they're going to get... Uh, they're going to get it invented so that the whole pregnancy can be in the laboratory. Mm -hmm. She thought that was just around the corner. And, uh, and she says at the point where they get it all perfected, which is really interesting because she said it would have to be men to invent all this. She says then women will get arms, you know, we'll have weapons. This is North America. <laughs> we'll have weapons and we'll take it from the men uh, by force and then we'll control it. Well, I thought her book really sold a lot. And she became you know, pretty wealthy. She got lots of really um, intellectual feminists just thinking she was the best thing that ever happened. And then she dropped off the scene. And we never heard anything about her for years and years. And I happened to ask my editor um, <clears throat> that Bantam Dell if she knew her and if she knew her book and she said, oh sure, oh yeah, I know her. We had Thanksgiving meal together a few years ago. I found out that woman must have been one of those who just never recovered from the insanity that of her book and the success she had for it, that she never wrote another book because she went off the deep end. And so, you know, friends kind of keep her together, but she's not well. You know, it was a crazy idea that she had as a young woman. She wrote it down. It was like a term paper, and yet it was taken so seriously that a lot of women went, well, look, now we have young university women in the United States for years. They've been selling their eggs for tuition. And so they're having all of these hormone shots. They're going, I can't, I can't find a man that... And I'm too neurotic to have a baby now. So I think I'll be better when I'm 38. Mm -hmm. So I want my 25-year-old eggs over here in the freezer. So when I find the perfect man when I'm 38 or 40, and I'm too old to get a birth, then we can install these perfect little eggs. It's pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. and we yet, hear about that thing in Sweden, too. Uh, we have feminists, they talk of uh, yeah. it's a human right to get the same section. Yeah, and yeah. It's quite uh, common. Uh, yeah. And so they're, the, they're making more noise than you are, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Because <clears throat> here's what I think we have to say. Let's look at, I think we have to look at the trends. And I think it's common in a country like Sweden where the maternal mortality is known to be low. It's one of the lower ones. So they would, oh yeah, we're great. Everything has to be good. But look where you're going. And so where's the trend? Well, what was the what was the C-section rate? Uh, does anybody know the cesarean rate here in Sweden in let's say 1995 or give me a number in the 90s? No, 12. 12? So, 90s? Okay, so now, what's the most recent you have? 2000? No, not in all Sweden. 17, 17, 18. 18 percent in the whole country. In Stockholm? Yeah, in Stockholm we have higher, but in Sweden. In Sweden, 18. In Stockholm, 23. Yeah. And then Stockholm is 23. Okay, so we see it's not going down. So the trend line is up. Yeah, but I think that the biggest problem is that the women who want the cesarean, it's that the doctors have so much infants and they, the, the medicine and, and, and they're so much afraid of the risks. Mm -hmm. That's what really yeah. is, uh, mm -hmm. in the, in the world. So, see, you're already here. In both cases here, you're over what the World Health Organization mm -hmm. said should be no more than, you know, it should, we want it less than 15. 
So if you look at the U.S., <coughs> the, the highest C-section rate of hospitals I've heard of in the U.S. is 80 percent. <laughs> this is in Dallas. Dallas. <laughs> and these are wealthy women. These are educated, educated women. Um, and their insurance companies happy to pay for this. Really happy because it, it's all linked. It's the profit, you know, the profit industry. But overall, in the U.S., we're about 34%. Uh, but we don't know our maternal death rate. We don't know our maternal death rate. We know that 50 countries, 49 countries do better. And we don't know what we really do because we're very underreported. So who knows? Maybe, maybe 60 countries do better than the U.S. in preventing maternal death. And I am shocked by how many women died because of the cesarean they had, not the reason for the cesarean. And the danger goes greater with if she has the first baby cesarean, and then you have the second baby, the third baby, the fourth baby. If you have women who will have a large family, I mean, it gets really dangerous for us. And I have so many women who died because of it that I know the case reports. When the doctors do up too many, they get careless. They cut things they shouldn't cut. They forget things, leave it inside the woman. I mean, just a lot of different things. And there's placental problems in the next pregnancy. So countries with a low birth rate, uh, where a typical woman has no more than two, can go, well, it doesn't matter. But I still know women that died after only one C-section in the next pregnancy from placental problems. So if you really want, you know, your C-section, if you want your maternal death rate to be low, you don't want to have too many C-sections. You don't want to have too many inductions. These are big factors in the countries where the maternal death rate's high, in, in the industrialized countries, in the wealthy countries. Uh, so, that one can be a hard argument to make to women who are terrified of birth because they say, I want it. Now, um, I, taught, I was at Karolinska Institute last year and I talked to some of the midwives there and they said, these women who are so afraid, we can get a bunch of them will agree to come in and have some talk about what scares them. Um, and I don't know if they call it a fear clinic, but that's really what it is. Mm -hmm. They sit in a, a pleasant little room, nice cozy room, there'll, there'll be no interruptions. And I th think they said, you know, it would be an hour long visit. Mm -hmm. It's thought to be a good, a good, you know, uh, efficient, uh, but effective way to reduce the fear in these women. I said, and there might be several visits in a pregnancy. I said, what's the rate of vaginal birth in those women that did come in? They said 80%. That's a Karolinska. So you might check on that and see if you can duplicate that in the smaller hospitals. In the rest of Sweden, too, you know, how do you turn it around before it, you have to have a bunch of sad husbands out there because I know too many sad husbands. And sad babies. And sad babies. Yeah, you can't just say it's about getting the baby out of the woman as if the woman is an obstacle. The woman is a person with feelings. So the woman who wants the C-section, well, maybe, maybe, maybe she'll get one, but let's try to see if we can reduce her fear. Let's see if it's maybe not too late for her to go, oh, I mean, could you watch some something pleasant and fun? It's not like, uh, you know, the women that think, or the people that think, oh, there should never be abortion no matter what. And so they have that silent screen movie, you have to watch that before you have an abortion. Mm. It's not like that. This is, it's not horrifying to watch an elephant give birth. It's not scary to watch these things. So let's try it. It's almost in the, in the natural birth. Thing is almost an extreme. Mm -hmm. like, uh, yeah. I mentioned uh, yeah. trying to give birth without pain relief or 
trying to get by on other yeah. means, then you're almost an extremist. Mm -hmm. yeah. People just kind of categorize you and put you in, oh, okay, mm -hmm. you're one of them, and then, and then yeah. they go and... You know. And that's what you have to keep. It's, this is another thing that Gene Sharp says, that the oppressed, you know, I'm going to say you're an oppressed group now. <laughs> yeah. And so don't think like, oh, well, we're going to stay oppressed. You think, oh, we have to educate. So we have to, we have to have some good slogans. They have to be, your slogans have to be well chosen. They have to be clever. Um, it's good if they're humorous. Yeah. And and then decide what are, which are the best. You need some people that have a marketing mind, you know, mm -hmm. and how to promote these these thoughts and. You could, you know, have somebody with a banner out here, you know, a couple of boats go by with a banner in between. <laughs> Did you know that humans can give birth as well as ma mammals if they have the proper education? I mean, you know, but a few words. Yeah. I'm also thinking about this tendency that a lot of women want the delivery to go really fast. They want the Pitocin yeah. and, you know, they want yeah. this fast delivery to just yeah. get it over with. You could do some funny skits, you know. Um, you know, if you don't want sex to go so fast, why do you want the birth to go so fast? It's the same organ. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, really keep putting the idea that it's about sex. Because that is like, in the hospital they want you to forget it has anything to do with sex. That was the whole thing about men coming into the birth room. How does a male doctor get in another man's bedroom? He scares him. That's how. I know the secrets of women. I have the magic tool. <laughs> you know nothing, little man. Uh, well, you know, that's a real destructive idea, but it's been really successful for centuries. For centuries, because this all started with, you know, Louis, Louis the Fourteenth, the Sun King. 